Well, good morning, Rock Church family. I hope you're tuning in online. Today, we've got a special treat for you with some music from Demetrius and I. So why don't you enter in with praise and worship with us? Don't forget, if you want to still give to the church, things are still going on. We're still blessing the community. But you can go to our website at therockchurchbakersfield.com and click on giving, and it'll take you and tell you everything you need to know about how to get us the tithe and offering that you'd like to give. So Rock Church, I know you're at home. I know you're having a good time. You're probably in your pajamas, but you can still stand up and worship the Lord with us. And it's 
today, your house right now can be the Holy of Holies. Just worship him this morning right where you are. Close your eyes. Picture yourself walking the streets of gold. Picture yourself singing with the angels this morning. We're going to sing, take me into the Holy of Holies one more time in the chorus. Join in at your houses. And take me into the Holy of Holies. Touch my lips, here I am. Take the call and touch my
He's our strong tower. He's our foundation. We should not be shaken if we're firm in him. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. change our circumstance. Father God, we give all to you this morning, Lord Jesus. Father, move us out of the equation, Lord God, and go big in our hearts today, Lord God. During this time when we may not be in a sanctuary, a church, we are the walking sanctuary. Father God, give us wisdom, give us courage, Lord Jesus, to spread your world, word, Lord God, throughout this world. Father God, use us today, Lord God. Father God, this is where, these times like this, this is where we get to put to action everything we've learned. We can't be casual Christians anymore. It's time for us to share the gospel with the people around us. Maybe it's the people in our family that we've been afraid to talk to them about you, Lord Jesus. Father, give us courage, the right words to say, Lord God. Father, maybe it's that person in the grocery store that we're walking by, Lord God, that we can just say a prayer. We feel that they need you. And Father God, we pray for them. Father God, if it's the people in our work, if we're working for considered essential services for our government and you're still having to work, put your hands about them, Lord God. Keep them safe, Lord Jesus. Let's be an example, church, so that people look to us and say, why aren't you shaken? It's because we have Jesus Christ. 
let me tell you about them. And so, Father God, we just thank you and praise you, Lord Jesus, Father, for everything that you've given us, Lord God, Father, for your presence, Lord God, and for your love, Lord Jesus. We lift your name on high today in your mighty and holy name. Amen. Through all of these times, folks, and uh, just want you to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Our God is able to minister life and life abundantly to us, and uh, his mercy endureth forever. You know, as I shared on Wednesday night, I think this is a forerunner of a new, new thing that's going to be happening, a new dispensation. We're getting close to uh, the coming of the Lord. Uh, and folks, we're going to see things changing in our world. But there's a kingdom, as I've taught you, that cannot be shaken, a kingdom that's not going to change, and that is the kingdom of our Lord. And this kingdom operates by love, by God's mercy, by God's grace. This kingdom is a kingdom we can rely on. This kingdom is a kingdom that we can stand in and be firm in, for our God is with us, and our God is great. Our God is awesome. His word is coming to pass, and folks, when we read the prophecies of end times, we realize that there's going to be some, some very horrible things that happen on this earth, some very trying times, some times that's going to stretch your faith. But thank God, faith can be stretched. It's from glory to glory, faith to faith, line upon line, the word of God growing inside of each of us. So allow God to stretch you. Stand in faith more than ever before. I want to talk to you and church, for those of you that have been part of uh, the ministry of The Rock, you've heard me teach on the mercy covering of God, but more than ever we need to be depending upon His mercy, crying out for it, and understanding how to stand in faith with it, because mercy is more than us crying out. It's an understanding of what God's mercy does. And God's mercy is the key for you. It's a key to the kingdom. It's a key to the heart of God. It's a key to receiving your inheritance. And so we want to just refresh you in this. And folks, we've taught you to rise up every morning and to pray the mercy covering, to pray the mercy prayer in your life and over the lives of your family and the body of Christ and those that you are concerned about. And it's so important that we, we keep this in us. You know, it seems like we forget uh, what to do. We, uh, we do it for a while and then things sort of catch up with us and we get caught up in things and uh, all of a sudden we're not doing it any longer. But there's something we need to know about mercy, again, and be refreshed in it. In Psalms 103, verses 17 through 22, it says this, But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to his children's children, to such as keep his covenant and to those who remember his commandments to do them. Here, the mercy of God is explained to us that it's everlasting to everlasting, but there's a condition, if you will, in this. It's we have to honor him. We have to reverence him. We have to have that godly fear of him. And we have done that when we've confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, but we need to continue in that in our life. That means we're going to be repenting when we fall into sin, repenting when our hearts are not right. We're going to honor him. He becomes more valuable than anything else in our lives. And then he says his mercy comes to those who uh, remember and keep his covenant and remember his commandments and to do them. 
Well, folks, we can't just be Christians who are not doers. The Word of God in James tells us that we cannot be hearers only. We have to be hearers and doers of the Word of God, which means we have to be actively being changed and transformed. We have to be actively living that out for God's glory and honor. It's not a choice that we can uh, say, well, I'll choose not today to do it, and I'll choose not to do it for a month and a half. Uh, the choice is, choose you this day who you're going to serve. And you have to do that every day. And that's why mercy's renewed every morning. We'll read a scripture about that in a minute. But God wants you to commit every day to him. Choose you this day who you're going to serve. Are you going to remember his covenant and keep it? Are you going to remember his covenants, his covenant, and to uh, do all of his commandments? Then in verse 19, it says, the Lord is established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Folks, one thing we need to, to grab hold of with great joy is that his kingdom rules over all. It may look like the world is out of control, and in the natural, it is. Fear is grabbing the world in the spiritual, and it is for those that don't know him, but God's kingdom rules, and you're in the kingdom of God. God can protect you, watch over you, provide for you. God will see you through. God will give you joy. Even though your heart is heavy laden, God can give you joy inside of that. God can raise you up. He's the glory and the lifter of your head. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength and do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in places of his dominion. Well, God's dominion is over this entire earth. And so, folks, you have that authority inside of you to walk in the dominion of God, to walk in the authority of God, the blessing of God, in the covenant of God that protects you, watches over you, and provides for you. In a covenant that even says when death comes, you just simply slip into the presence of God. You simply move into heaven. God's covenant answers everything for us. That's why his kingdom rules over everything. Because God's kingdom, God's covenant, God's commandments answer everything in our lives. And there it comes from mercy. That if he is merciful to us because we are obeying, we're going to find his love and folks, faith worketh by love. The faith that we have will begin to be energized from heaven. In Psalms 108, the word of the Lord speaks to us in, in verse 4. And it says this, For mercy is great above the heavens, and your truth reaches to the clouds. Well, folks, when we, when we look at this, mercy is in the heavens. God's watching over us. Jesus stands before the throne, and he is ministering the Holy Spirit to us, and he's speaking his word into this world. But it says truth reaches. When it, when it comes into our heart and becomes alive, we reach into the clouds to get the mercy so that mercy and truth can be joined together. Folks, you can't have faith without mercy, and that's the truth. You know, I've heard so many people say, we don't need mercy now because we have faith. Well, faith works by love. Without mercy, your faith isn't going to work. You're not going to walk in the power of what you believe until you honestly reach into the clouds and get the mercy of God. And how do you do that? Through prayer, through going to the throne room and talking with God, through asking God to be merciful to you and teach you how to walk in his ways. The psalmist David said, Father, teach me your way. Show me how to live it. Show me how to walk it. Be merciful unto me. And folks, that's what we need to be praying. God, be merciful unto me and teach me and show me how to walk in your ways, how to perform your word to complete it in my life. That's the power of God's word. That's the power of his heart. That's the power of everything he is, is in his love. It's in his mercy, his loving kindness, which he has showed towards us who believe. It's all there for us, but it's up to us to stand and believe and reach into heaven. Reach there and get that love of God. In Lamentations chapter 3, the word of the Lord speaks to us a very powerful message one that I have taught around the world and uh, this mercy covering. But in Lamentations chapter 3, the, the word of God gives us a hope. Everybody say hope. 
Hallelujah. Gives us a hope in Christ to stand in Him. Verses 23. Uh, let's go to verse 22. Though the Lord's mercy, through the Lord's mercy, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Hallelujah. Just those two scriptures have such depth of life for us that we can grab hold of and hang on to in the midst of all the things that are going on in this world. You know, People are afraid they're not going to have enough toilet paper and they're raiding the stores. What's going to happen when much more takes place in this world? When they don't have food to eat? When they are under suppression? What's going to happen then, folks? The word of the Lord tells us that we have a place we can hide. We have a place we can go. That we will not be consumed by fear, sickness, disease, by anything that's not of God. It says, through his mercies, we are not consumed by anything. So don't wake up in the morning and be consumed by the fear or wonder of what's going to happen today. Get up in the morning and speak his word about his mercy. Believe in faith in his mercy. Let that truth that is in you, that he's your provider, cause you to reach up and just be bathed in the mercy, the love, the loving kindnesses of God. So you will not be consumed because his compassion, his love does not fail. His love covers a multitude of sin. His love never fails, church. He's always with us. So don't worry about what today has to offer. Look at what heaven has to offer. Hallelujah. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Every morning, God is ready to bathe us in his love, his mercy. He's ready to stop any consumption that the enemy has set against us. This coronavirus is a consumption. It is consuming the health of people. It's consuming their spiritual life because they're in great fear. Christians may be in doubt and unbelief. Why is God allowing this to happen? And I speak to you today. God prophesied things would happen. Pestilence would happen because of the way of a wicked man. Wickedness has brought this into the world, but the light of God can consume it. The light of God can stop it. God didn't, God didn't author this. But listen to me. He did author faith, for he is the author and the finisher of our faith. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. It's renewed every morning for a purpose, because God said, give no thought for tomorrow, for today has enough concerns of its own. So mercy is given to us, the covering of God, so that the truth, the faith that we have can operate in fullness of strength, that we can speak to the mountain and tell it to be thou removed. That we can stand when no one else is standing. When people are falling at our right and our left hand side, we are still standing in Christ, strong in the Lord and the power of his might. That's the promises of God. In church, God gives it every morning because he wants his love for you to be fresh. He wants your love for him to be fresh. Not a two-week-old love like baked bread that's two weeks old, but the bread of life, fresh, fresh out of the oven of God, fresh out of his heart, a, a stream of living water, a, a life-flowing substance from heaven. He wants it to be real inside of you. He wants you to know the depth of his love. Well, folks, if you're not experiencing it on a daily basis, you'll never get to the depth of his love because you'll always be going back to where you were. But if we continue to press on, to push in, we'll understand more and more of the greatness of God, the height, the depth, the breadth, and the width of God. We'll be able to push in and understand that we are to be rooted and grounded in faith and in love. Again, the two work together. Without love, faith does not work. God's mercy is his love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's God's love. That's God's mercy. That whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the grace of God. For when mercy is received, grace is granted in your time of need. 
So important that we lay hold of this. In Micah, the word of the Lord also has a strong word for us to stand in. In chapter 7 of Micah, hallelujah. Here in Micah in chapter 7, the word of the Lord gives us a, a word that should bring great joy into our heart. In Micah chapter 7, beginning in verse 18, who is a God like you pardoning iniquity? And church, if there's ever a time to be repenting, it's right now. We're supposed to get our garments clean and holy for the coming of the Lord. We don't need to be like those in Revelation chapter 6 who defiled their garments and had to die as martyrs to get their garments clean again. We need to be a people who are clean and, and rejoicing in the pardon that God has given us through Jesus Christ. It says, who is a God like you, a pardoning iniquity, passing over the transgressions of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain anger forever because he delights in mercy. I've said this so many times. Do you want to make God happy? Do you want to make God delight? Well, then the word of God says he delights in being merciful. He delights in that. He wants to forgive. He wants to cover. He wants to energize your faith. He will again have compassion on us and subdue our iniquity. Folks, so many have tried to quit sinning, and I tell you, it's hard in the flesh. In fact, it's almost impossible in fact, it is impossible. But in Christ, in his mercy, in his fathomless love for us, he will subdue. He will capture it, rip it from our soul. Because his word, his mercy will renew our mind. It will utterly set us free. And he who the sun sets free is free indeed. Jesus himself is not only our righteousness that goes before us, he is the mercy of God given to us. He is the love of God given to us. He is the author of our faith. So we need to stand in that and understand we need our sins subdued. We need that great pardoning from God. We need to delight in the gift that he gave us called mercy, his son, because God delights in mercy. In Titus, over in the New Testament, the word of the Lord also speaks to us about what God has done for us. And in Titus, the word of the Lord speaks to us about how we were saved by mercy. Yes, saved by mercy, amen. We read scriptures, it says we're saved by grace, but we're also saved by mercy. Chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, says this to us. All right, let's look at four. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Wow, this says that, that God in his mercy saved us. Not, not what we've done, but what he did. His mercy saved us, and he's washed us unto regeneration. Well, folks, the word of the Lord tells us that we should confess our sins to him, and he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this regeneration is an ongoing process that's happening inside of us. Then he's giving us the newness of the Holy Spirit. Peter told us to be ye continually filled with the Spirit of God. Well, this is how you do it. By coming and thanking God for his mercy that he's bestowed upon us. That he would give us newness every morning through his mercy. The newness of his Spirit, a quickening in our flesh, a renewing of our mind, a filling of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Then he goes on and he says this to us, which is so important, that we become heirs. Again, I talked to you Wednesday night about, you know, the covenant. We're heirs to a, a covenant of promise. We're joint heirs with Christ. Here he tells us how to activate that. Yes, Jesus purchased it. Jesus did it. But if we don't come to him the way we should and ask for his mercy and grace, if we don't obey his commandments 
if we don't remember his covenant, if we stay in our sin, then we're not going to experience the fullness that we have in Christ, the inheritance that we have in him. It's only by living it do we begin to experience the fathomless grace of God, the fathomless depths of God. It's only by that that we begin to experience what he's given to us. When we experience it, we can then give it to others. Paul in Romans chapter 15 verse 18 said, I will not dare come to you and I will not teach you anything that God has not wrought both in word and deed in my life. In other words, I'm not going to teach you anything that I have not experienced myself in faith. I will not tell you about something that God has not wrought in me that I'm not living. I'm going to, I'm going to live and teach you what I'm living, what I know. Because then it's faith-filled. Well, folks, as we walk into the greater things of God, our faith expands. We expand the stakes of our tent. Our, our growth in God begins to happen, and that maturing begins to flow inside of us and through us. And then we can begin to experience and be the ministers of light that God called us to be. You know, there's ministers of light, and then there's ministers of fire. God said he would make his ministers a flame of fire and the souls of men like logs. Folks, the further we go in, the light turns into fire. The light turns in to that all-consuming fire of God. Not the consuming of sin and the consuming of the, of the things of this world. God's mercy takes care of that so that we are not consumed. But we begin to walk in another type of consuming. The consuming fire of God. The, the power, the wonder, the awesomeness of our God. And that's where we want to live. That's where we want to stay says, my cup runneth over. Well, if you've ever looked at a cup that's running over after you quit pouring water in it, the water is actually above the cup. It's called the meniscus. And that's literally what it talks about when it says, my cup runneth over, that we should be living in the meniscus. We always have more than enough. Why? Because our God is El Shaddai. Our God is the God of more than enough. Our God is Jehovah Yuri, our provider. He is our healer, our righteousness, our justifier. He is everything we need him to be. But when we're being filled and we're running over, that's when we truly begin to experience who our God really is. He takes us to a greater depth, greater heights in him. So it's important, church, that we stand in this and walk in this. Back in Proverbs chapter 3, the word of the Lord talks about binding something around our neck. And again, same two things we've been talking about. Verse 3, let mercy and truth, let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Here the word of the Lord tells us to bind truth and mercy around our neck. Why around our neck? Well, one, so that we won't lose it. Let not mercy forsake you. Let not truth forsake you. In other words, don't forget that these are available, that these are here for you, that it is the heart of God for you. God wants us to walk in this fullness, and he says, when we bind them around our neck, you'll always feel, if you will, the weight of glory, the eternal weight of glory, his love and his mercy. That's where God's glory is being revealed to you. The depths of his glory will be revealed when we bind mercy and truth around our neck and it covers our heart. It is so important that we allow this to happen in our lives because God is a great God. God is a God who loves us and has provided a way for us. So he says, bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. You know, your heart has pages. Isn't that amazing? Your heart has pages. There's the pages where you've been wounded and you've been hurt and, and it brings up uh, sadness in your life. There's pages that brings up criticalness or bitterness, unforgiveness. But when you start writing that over again with God's mercy and God's truth, the old pages begin to be removed and new pages begin to be written. Pages that will bring you into the fullness of God. Pages that will be in your heart 
For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You'll have something else to speak, something else to read. Hallelujah. You'll have that in your heart. Then it says, you'll also find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Wow. High esteem in the sight of God. Folks, listen to this. Do you want God to say, well done, my good and faithful servant? This is high esteem in God. And God says that when you bind them around your neck, these two things, mercy and truth, mercy's in the heavens, truth reaches into the clouds, hallelujah, mercy and truth, when we have them, we're going to find favor, God's favor. See, I believe in faith, for God is pleased by faith. But I have to have faith in his mercy, what his love has provided for me. What mercy does in my heart. He says, write them there. Hallelujah. That means you have to take time to inscribe them in your heart. It's not something you just write with a pencil. They're literally inscribed. Just like with metal, it takes something powerful and sharp to inscribe metal and write a name or a, a sentence or a phrase. It takes time for you to inscribe it through study and prayer through asking for God's mercy to show you his ways. Then he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. How can you trust in the Lord with all your heart if you don't have a page on mercy and truth? Because it's almost impossible to trust God if you don't have faith in his mercy and you're not understanding or receiving his truth by faith. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. In all your ways, acknowledge him. It doesn't mean, yeah, God's with me while I'm doing this. It means the way you do things, you are acknowledging him. The way you speak, you are acknowledging him. The way you forgive people, you are acknowledging him. The way you love, the way you pray, the way you fast for others. In that sacrificial life for laying down your life for someone else. That's when you're acknowledging him in your ways. And then look what happens. He will direct your paths. Well, God tells us what in the 23rd Psalm? Though we, yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That is a pathway that God has made. Folks, there's going to be trouble all through your life, whether it's this virus or a financial thing or, or a family member, whatever it is, there's going to be trouble. But there's a path that God has for you that takes you to a feast in the presence of your enemies. That causes you to see God's rod and staff comforting you and protecting you. God wants us to understand that and lay hold of that. He will direct your path. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Again, back in Micah, the word of the Lord speaks to us about a visitation from God in chapter 6. Verses 8 and 9. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Hallelujah. Folks, listen. To do justly means I know the truth. You can't be just with people if you don't know the truth. But the truth will cause you to live justly before all people. For you will live by God's word, by the direction of his spirit. You will love his mercy because his mercy empowers that life. And you are humbled in the sight of God because of what you see God doing in your life and in the lives of those you're praying for. We are humbled at God's goodness in the midst of all this turmoil in this world. God is still graciously moving in our lives. God is telling us what to look for, what to see, what to love, what to make sure is rooted and grounded in our hearts and in our lives. He says in verse 9, the Lord's voice cries to the city, wisdom shall see your name. Hear the rod who has appointed it. God literally says when his people are walking justly, loving mercy and walking humbly, that God's voice is going to cry to our city. Folks, this is the time for the church to initiate revival in our city. 
showing this, this, this world the goodness of our God and the power of his provision, the wonder of his salvation. His wisdom will cause his name to be known. The wisdom in which we operate with, acknowledging him in all of our ways. We live by his wisdom and acknowledge him. He directs our path. And here, it causes his name to be known. Well, folks, there shouldn't be anything greater in our life than desiring that the name of Jesus be known in all this world. That he be highly exalted. That he be lifted up. And he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Church, we can do that and cause revival to sweep the land. Cause salvation to flow into the lives of those who are hurting and lost. We are the messengers of hope, the messengers of life. We carry the power of God, the word of his power. We walk in his wisdom and in his love and his tender kindness. God wants us to be that church and arise and walk in the fullness of God. And finally, folks, in Hebrews 4.16, the word of God still stands, Old Testament and New Testament. In 4.16, it tells us something that is so powerful. Read it to you many times. I know you've studied it. I know many of you have heard me preach this before, but folks, it is good to be refreshed in a truth that will utterly cause your life to be changing day by day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Folks, right now, grace of God is needed desperately. The grace of God is needed by those who are lost, by those who are captured by fear. The grace of God is needed desperately to provide the needs of his people and of the lost. Grace is greatly needed to show Jesus Christ and have his name known throughout the land. Let us come to the throne of God boldly. That doesn't mean we come arrogantly. It means we know we're accepted. We're accepted of God. We're loved of God. Just like a child will run to mommy or daddy or a grandparent knowing that they are loved by them and that they'll always be accepted. God is saying, I'll always accept you. I'm here to, to cleanse you if you need cleansing. I'm here to strengthen you if you are weak. I'm here to give you peace if you have none. God is always ready to move on behalf of his children. So he says, you can come to this, this throne knowing that because you know Jesus Christ is Lord, that he's going to accept you, no matter what condition you are in. But when you leave, you're going to be in a better condition. You're going to be sporting a nice new white robe, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb and the word of life. Because his mercy and his truth moved upon you. His grace was sufficient for you. He says, obtain that mercy. Well, the word of God tells us that, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Well, folks, if we're sharing the gospel with the lost, we're being merciful. If we're giving them food, we're being merciful. If we're being an example, we're being merciful. If we're loving and forgiving people, we're being merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Here it says, obtain mercy that you might receive grace in your time of need. Right now is a time for the church to move into revival. Revival means something that was alive and is now dying. It's not talking about the lost. Revival is about getting the church alive. God will breathe a new breath of life inside of you. He'll stir up the gifts inside of you and teach you how to stir them up. Revival, he's going to breathe life right now into his church. That's, that's what I've been talking about, church. I believe God is using what the enemy wanted to destroy. God is using it to wake up this spiritual giant called the church of the living God, the body of Christ. We are the powerful. We are the mighty in God. Not who we are, who he is inside of us. God wants us to receive his mercy he wants us to love mercy. If we love mercy, we're going to be calling out for it. 
We're going to be standing in the faith of it. We're going to rejoice in the promises of it. And we're going to allow God's grace then to flow in our lives. God's unmerited favor in our life. God's power in our life. God's provision in our life. The covenant begins to flow in our life. And God begins to be the supplier of everything unto life and godliness. That's how you walk in the, the awesomeness of our God and the wonder of our God. You get his favor, folks, and then doors open to you that were never opened before. Provision comes to you that had never come to you before. You're able to meet the needs of many because God's grace, his favor is flowing through you. You become that distribution center that God has caused us and called us to be. So if we approach this throne, we have to come with that spirit of humility, but in recognition that we're accepted and that we are loved. In recognition that God meets us where we're at. He cleanses us if we need cleansing. He restores our soul if our soul needs restoring. He regenerates us if we need to be regenerated. He gives us the newness of the Holy Spirit if we're drawing weak in it. He illuminates the path for us that we might walk in it because of his mercy and his truth. Church, it's up to us. People are saying it's up to God. Well, God put us on this earth to be his voice, to be his hands extended. That's exactly what the disciples prayed. They said after they were beaten and they went back and prayed together, they said, let us be your hands extended. Let us speak as the oracles of God. We are God's agents on this earth. We are his ambassadors to take this world, this word to the world, to take this wor word to the lost and allow the spirit of the Lord to draw men in. For all we can do is plant and all we can do is water. God will give the increase. So church, let's allow God to do the increase. Let's give him something to work with. Let's plant his word. Let's water his word in prayer that he might give the increase. Let us stand in mercy and in grace. If you're listening to this and you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord, salvation is simple. It is to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That God had a plan and sent him to this earth to die for our sins. That we might have eternal life in Christ. If you'll just cry out and say, God, I'm a sinner and I, I want to be saved and I believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God who died for me and rose again, then I want you to know that God's going to wash your sins away. He's going to open the doors of heaven. He's going to flood into your heart. He's going to give you newness of life. Hallelujah. We are saved by mercy. He's going to regenerate you, give you the newness of the Holy Spirit. We are saved by grace. God's grace will come in our time of need. I want you to know God is real. People can say religion is a crutch. People can say that religion is, is just the, the thoughts of man. But I want you to know, ask anyone that truly knows God, and they will tell you it's not a religion. The living God himself lives inside of us. He talks with us. He comforts us. He lifts us up. He provides for us. We know him. We don't know just a religion. We know the God of it. We know the Savior that came for us, and he lives inside of us. You can have that right now. Just bow your head, close your eyes, ask Christ into your heart. Confess that he is the Lord and Savior, that he died for you and he rose from the grave and covered your sins with his blood and forgave you, gives you the newness of life. If you're out there today and you've been a Christian that's been away from the Lord, it's a time to repent, it's a time to come home. Like the parable of the prodigal son, he wanted to take his inheritance and go spend it on things of the world. But when his father saw him coming back, he said, get the robe, get the ring, get the fatted calf, for my son has returned. 
I want you to know God has not rejected you. God is drawing you. God is calling you. He's saying, come home. Repent. Repent. Confess your sins. Ask me to forgive you. I will move in your life. I will set you free. And I again will regenerate you. I will again give you the newness of the Holy Spirit. I will restore your soul and my grace and my mercy will flow for you. That's a promise from heaven. It's a promise from God. God is not a man that he should lie. God is faithful to perform his word. Stand in his word and rejoice, church. If you have a need, healing, provision, whatever it is, take it before God right now. Raise your hands to God and, and, and confess that he's your supplier. Not man, not something that man is doing, but that which God is doing, which God can do in your life. Cry out for his mercy. Be merciful to others. And watch God give you his grace in your time of need, healing your body, providing for you. God will do it. He's faithful. We serve an awesome and a mighty God. So church, I want you to rejoice today. I want to thank Chad and Demetrius for coming down and giving us some praise and worship. And you know, it, it was awesome and it was great. The anointing was here in this building. I pray you felt it in your home and that you entered in because that's part of being merciful. That's part of being surrendered to God. God's grace then begins to flow in your life. Giving praise every day with music or without giving praise because our God reigns. God bless you. Have a blessed and awesome day. We'll be talking to you soon again in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.